Good morning, everybody. An aspect of archaeological research I have been carrying out during the last 15 years or so in the <coughs> uh, Bellary district of Karnataka. And that has produced fascinating uh, data sets which has helped us reconstruct the life ways of uh, antegatherals transitioning into early agriculturists. And these early agriculturists were the first uh, communities anywhere in India who uh, settled down and established uh, village economies based on domestication of select animals and select uh, plant foods such as pulses, millets and uh, cereals and so on. Uh, this is an important phase in the cultural evolution of mankind and this was the time period which laid the basis for the development of modern day civilizations anywhere in the world. So the Neolithic phase is generally referred to as Neolithic revolution and I refer to this uh, particular site uh, at Bellari uh, called Sanganakallu. Uh, which was excavated by my team for over a decade or so and that has contributed to various other um, achievements in the field of not only in the field of archaeology but also in the field of uh, heritage education which we call now public outreach archaeology and so on. So if you look at this uh, image here, context is they draw, drawn by people who established villages for the first time. Actually it has implications in terms of belief systems that emerged when you know, people began to depend on productivity of the environment. So environmental productivity assured, you know, economy which, you know, sustained their ways of life. And so bull happened to be the ritual animal. It is considered male fertility deity. And it occurs, uh, you know, in the early agricultural societies ranging in time from 12,000 years to 14,000 years ago. So since then we see two important imageries uh, frequently uh, occurring in the context of early agricultural societies. One is mother goddess. Uh, mother goddess ant antecedents are much deeper in time, whereas uh, the bull appears for the first time in the Neolithic context. So there were sanctuaries, domestic sanctuaries, constructed by these early agriculturists in Southwest Asia. And then we see this particular person, uh, Robert Brucefoot. He was uh, responsible for the discovery of a large number, nearly 500 archaeological sites of the prehistoric period. And he's also credited for the discovery of the oldest human settlements in India. Now they are dated to about 15 lakh years or so. But he was also responsible for the discovery of a large number of these uh, Neolithic sites. In particular, in the Bellari region, the former Royal Sima, uh, he discovered nearly 200 sites. And then many of these sites are part of the landscape. They are buried. Uh, subsurface uh, archaeological remains and they are not easily seen by common man and a professional also requires a special skill to identify their presence and so on. And so such sites are being, being consumed by modern day developmental activities and uh, you know a lot of information about the prehistoric period uh, is preserved in these archaeological sites. So if we lose them forever, we lose a lot of information uh, which can help us reconstruct the life phase of ancient societies and how they progress towards modern civilization and so on. Not only that, he laid the foundations for, you know, identifying economic geological sources in the area. And uh, he's been regarded as father of Indian prehistory. Prehistory refers to the time period before the invention of a written language. But in India, uh, we have the early, you know, earliest, uh, in, you know, written, written inscriptions date back to 3rd century BC. BC or so. So pre-3rd century BC time period, going back to the oldest settlement that I said, going back to 15 lakh period uh, years ago is uh, a <coughs> prehistoric period. And the earliest written records here uh, are is were issued by Mauryan King Ashoka. So that marks the end of prehistoric period and the beginning of a uh, historical period. So in order to uh, remember his contributions and also in order to make sure that the local people who live by the side of these archaeological sites, prehistoric archaeological sites, should also know. And it's not that we have a historical past which is only about 2,500 years uh, you know, <coughs> old, but we have much deeper past going back to 14, 15 lakh years ago, and people should know, and they will certainly be helpful in preserving in one way or the other the kind of uh, prehistoric heritage that we have in different parts of, uh, you know, India. This is a pristine landscape, which was a sketch uh, drawn by uh, Colin McKenzie's colleague, 
uh, nearly 220 years ago. It is called the Greenstone Belt or Sandur Cyst Belt, uh, a pass between Bellary and Hospet, and now is very close to the Jindal, you know, Vijayanagara steel plant on the western side and the Bellary Thermal Power Station on the eastern side of this particular pass. And then in the middle of the uh, uh, pass, you see this particular mound uh, as it existed 220 years ago. And that was a kind of uh, a mound that you see here. Uh, compare this mound feature with the you know, hills in and around here. This is the time when the pyramids were built in Egypt. Such, such mounds were also coming up in this part of uh, Indian subcontinent. So these have been identified as ash mounds. The mounds created or constructed by these early agro-pastoral communities who domesticated cattle, sheep, goat, and several other domestic animals at that point of time. But at that time, the cattle dung was not to put to any other use except for ritual purposes. That is the final statement that we are making. Where there are multiple theories about how these mounds were constructed, why these mounds were constructed, and what is the you know, purpose behind the construction of such mounds. So there are numerous such mounds. This was the first mound ever discovered in India, and that was discovered by Colin Mackenzie. He was later the first Surveyor General of India, and he was responsible for documenting this particular feature. Uh, it's called Kudutini Ash Mound. In early literature, it is referred to as Budhi Kanama Pass, or Budhi Kanave. So this is a pass, and this mound is the largest mound. But the significance of this uh, mound in the context of archaeology was first revealed by Robert Brucefoot, because he was the one who very meticulously went through these exposures and uh, was able to identify cultural material, material cultural remains in terms of uh, you know, pot shirts, broken pots, in terms of uh, uh, stone axes, polished stone axes, in terms of mortars and pestles and so on, grinding stones, and then even animal bones, cattle bones and so on. So when he found uh, a high frequency of cattle bones in various strata, he was very convinced that this was a product of Neolithic agro-pastoral cultural activity associated with uh, a particular practice of accumulating, deliberately accumulating cattle dung and setting it on fire. But all this mound did not you know, come into existence in one single episode. There were series of epilodes. And in the recent past, our team has been able to uh, establish a chronology of its uh, life history. So this has a longest uh, time span, 500 years. So over a period of 500 years, this mound was built by these Neolithic people. These were cattle stations. These were ritual uh, places, cattle reach associated with cattle and so on. And then these mounds were abandoned, and sometimes they were revisited. And some of these mounds were also part of the earliest villages that we come across in this area. And then we also see that when these mound uh, activities ceased altogether, around 1200 uh, BC or so, people began to revisit, the later people began to revisit, and there is sufficient evidence about the fact that these mounds were uh, connected to the life phase of even later period agricultural communities of the Iron Age. And uh, we have come across series of burials, uh, but not associated with the time when these mounds were being generated. So these are called ash mounds of the Neolithic period. So you can see here so many of these uh, examples uh, one is called sarcophagus. This is also sarcophagus. This is another view of the sarcophagus. And then you have these human remains contained in these sarcophagus. And then these urn burials. But this is the earliest uh, uh, type of uh, earthenware uh, you know, coffin, which were constructed by the megalithic people, not the Neolithic people. So these were Iron Age people. And that is the time when we have these special burials for a particular class of people in that particular society. So this kind of uh, you know, special burials were not meant for common man. And this is one another example where you have a, a human sitting in a sitting posture, and this is a human which is in a you know, supine posture. These are secondary burials. So they were exposed to uh, nature. They were sometimes uh, you know, cremated, and then, then they collected the skeletal remains and then contained them in these. And then otherwise, you have these uh, multiple urns, which were specially made for burying the dead. 
Uh, so the, these predate this kind of uh, multi-legged urns and so on. But all of them belong to one particular tradition of burial. Um, and then we refer to this particular phase as emergence of class structure or the emergence of elite because the political ec economies were on the rise during this period. Whereas in the Neolithic period, we come across uh, economies which were domestic in nature in the sense the productivity was not large scale, produce was consumed by the residents of the village and so on. Whereas here, when we say political economy, there are these organized, uh, you know, um, economies which involves procurement of raw material, processing raw material, and distribution of the produce and so on. So I was referring to this particular region, as we can see here, peninsular uh, coast, the Western Ghats, the interior, uh, you know, <coughs> inland uh, plateau, and then you have the Eastern Ghats and then the East Coast and so on. So this particular topography has characterized uh, what we call the in the differential distribution of rainfall. And what we see here is the emergence of landscapes associated with grasslands, associated with rainforests, associated with uh, deciduous forest and coastal mangrove forest uh, was in, is important for us to establish uh, man-land relationships or man-environment relationships. So climate plays a very important role apart from the geological base of this particular region. The way in which rainfall distribution uh, takes place, uh, has taken place and how the uh, network of these uh, forest uh, ecosystems have come into existence. It's not only the geological resources were playing a crucial role in the economic development of these early agriculturists, but also these uh, forest food resources, grassland food resources. In fact, what we see is the Neolithic sites, uh, majority of these Neolithic sites are adaptation to grassland environment. So these grasslands are typical of this rain shadow region uh, in the middle of the peninsula. And that particular belt uh, has witnessed the transition from hunter-gatherer way of life to um, agricultural way of life. And that also coincides with what we call the onset of uh, a dry phase around 4,300 years ago or so. When this particular dry phase uh, you know, ushered, the Indus civilization was witnessing its gradual decline or transformation. Now, most scientists and archaeologists do agree that around 4,200 years ago to 1900 uh, BC uh, ago, that 300 period, uh, the global climate was absolutely drier and drier. Uh, and then it lasted for more than 300 years, and that caused the decline of uh, Arapan civilization or Indus Valley civilization. But in contrast, what we see here in this region, we see the emergence of agricultural way of life and successfully adapting to the semi-arid dry conditions. And that is because uh, the interior landscape, this is an rocky landscape, not drained by major perennial rivers and things like that. The network of uh, streams is also not uh, very dense. Uh, so, but when we look at the sites which are located in the inland regions, away from the uh, you know, drainage network, and these settlements, early settlements are associated with hilltops and so on, one would wonder how could this land sustain these agricultural communities. So we had to find answers to this. So what we found was, the although this peninsular rocky landscape is considered not so well watered and compared with the Ganga, you know, Brahmaputra and Indus basins. But when we look at archaeological record and when we look at the geological features associated with the archaeological sites, we came across, uh, you know, abundant evidence to argue for, you know, <clears throat> that the interior semi-arid regions were much more well watered than the, the region which actually was experiencing drier conditions and so on. And then we see today it is very rocky, dry. Uh, you know, kind of landscape, but yet this land, this land uh, supported a successful transition from hunting gathering to early agricultural way of life and so on. So one of the sites uh, we come across, we came across, or we do come across across this entire region is characterized by the rocky, hilly landscapes. Most of these early villages were located on tops of the hills, and then the rock shelters were also uh, not the primary locations where human occupation took place, but they were the rock shelters were also associated with the you know range of uh, what we call incel works. And tops of these incel works were found ideal for locating these early villages and so on. 
this is the uh, hill range which is called the Greenstone Belt. I showed you the ash mound in the beginning that is located um, in, the, in the pass in this particular region. These are Inselbergs surrounded by vast this thing. And not a single river carries water even today in this region. And during the rainy season, there are only short-lived ephemeral streams. They dry off after a week or so. But otherwise, the hill is surrounded by such vast rolling plains and so on. And on top of this, we have a Neolithic settlement. Uh, and then the landscapes associated with yet another very important raw material uh, suitable for making polished stone axes by the, these early agriculturists also occurs in these granitic hills. So the dikes, they are called dolerate dikes or gabbro, and that was found ideal raw material for making polished stone axes, which are you know, various types of food producing, food processing, uh, stone tools were made. And then the, the landscape is natural fortification. On top of the hill, you have a made up uh, plain, made ground, and then the settlement takes place here. You can see a cluster of houses, not brick houses, but they are mud floored houses with wattle and hob, modern day huts that we see. And then you have these hills protecting them from you know, uh, strong winds and cold winds and even rainfall and so on. And then the excavations have uh, revealed the presence of this kind of circular alignment of stones, which were you know, uh, demarcating individual houses. And each of these were, you know, uh, sub you see this, each of these circles are surrounded by a series of post holes indicating that bamboo and such material was used for constructing a, a hut and so on. And this is the soil associated with human settlement. They are all gray, ashy soils, and they are called anthrosols associated with human activity. They contain a lot of microscopic remains, which the naked eye cannot see. So we need to employ modern methods to extract you know, information from um, what is buried, hidden in this. Suppose we have to talk about what type of food grains were cultivated by these people. We have to process these soils and then you know, extract the charred grains, which were, you know, the grains which were processed while processing some grains were charred. And the charred grains survive for thousands and thousands of years, unlike a fresh grain. So that carbon coating around the grain protects that as a shell and it remains forever. And so this, these soils are very, very critical for us and sampling them systematically from base to the top helps us how at different points of time, different food crops were uh, you know, uh, cultivated and how different crops which were of local origin and crops which were from outside were introduced into these areas. So such history, agricultural history can be reconstructed and the soil chemistry also helps us understand activities performed by these people at different points of time. And then each of these sites, you know, these open uh, boulders, we come across the bull imageries. Of course, not only the bull, but several other animal imageries, human uh, you know, imageries are also found. But this is the most dominant uh, imagery that we come across in the context of Neolithic of uh, this particular region. So this is one of the hills called Sanganakallu, the first site also studied by Robert Brucefoot, and uh, he identified this as the largest stone axe manufacturing site anywhere in South India at that point of time, about 4,000 years ago or so. And that is clearly evidenced by our investigations at that particular site. And then you have, this is the material, dolerite, which was used for making what we call polished stone axes, ground stone axes, or simply called stone cells. This is the diagnostic of uh, the Neolithic time period. And this is the typical uh, Indian bull, jebu, uh, humped bull. And there are three centers in India, the Baluchistan, uh, Central India, and Peninsular India, where wild progenitors of this particular breed of cattle lived. But so far in the archaeological context, we have not been able to trace the transition from wild morphology to domestic morphology. But what we see here is the domestic form, uh, domesticated form of the cattle and so on, long horn, very prominent hump and so on. And uh, this is a deified animal, as I said. And this is the kind of landscape we see where we have the earliest villages. And one would wonder why they set up these villages on tops of the hills. The simple answer is there were hundreds of springs uh, emanating from the sides of these hills. I mentioned about dolerite dike. I mentioned about the granite. So the granite dolerite relationship 
uh, intrusion, what we call, has given rise to various fissures and cracks. But as we go back in time, groundwater tables are higher and higher. Unlike the surface water, which flows from higher level to lower level, the groundwater flows from lower level to higher level also. So the water tables were high. This was all uh, swampy area 5,000 years ago. And then the water, high water tables would always uh, you know, flow up. And then you see the dikes you know, obstructing the flow of groundwater. And that obstruction caused uh, you know, the emergence of the springs on the sides of this. So as a result, all these hills, even 50 years ago, these hills have, were known for active spring areas. And you can imagine 5,000 years ago, they were much more luxurious and so on. And as a result of this, we also have you know, studied uh, the sand particles, sand particles on the landscape. So those sand particles transported by water flow, they are all well-rounded. And those sand particles which are disintegration of granite, they are all very angular and so on. So we could trace that particular process, you know, flow of water from the hillsides and terminating somewhere here. And you see these black patches here, black patches there. And these black patches, if you look back into the you know, Neolithic times, these were the ponds, you know, natural ponds, low-lying troughs and water used to collect there. And these swamps were ideal for water buffalo and so on and so forth. So that is where we've, we could explain the settlements, why they are situated where they are in terms of the availability of water resources throughout the year. In spite of low rainfall, 22 inches and less, this area 5,000 years ago was one of the most well-watered areas, in fact, better than North Indian uh, river and tracks and so on. So why we came back here is we had a lot of information about the nature of material culture of the Neolithic people, but we didn't have enough information about what type of food crops these people were cultivating. And when we came back to one of the sites, uh, we thought we should uh, fill the gap uh, in terms of you know, the information on the type of food crops, how the agricultural economy was successfully <clears throat> adapting to this particular landscape. So that is where when we came, we saw this kind of destruction taking place. This is one of the largest Neolithic sites anywhere in South India. More than 1,500 acres of land. The settlement spreads from hilltop to hillsides to the valleys between two hills and so on. And so we saw when we looked at this particular situation, it was very pathetic and we were at loss. And if it had continued, because this is the site when we landed there in 1997, we saw this fate of these hills, you know, and if we had left uncared for, the mining activity would have certainly leveled all these hills to the ground, like we have lost so many of the ash mounds in this region. So we started, we embarked on a fast track uh, you know, investigation, and uh, this is one area, it is called uh, uh, you know, Hireguda Hilltop, overlooking these hills. The first excavations were carried out here in 1946 by one B. Subarao, uh, following the work of Wheeler at Brahmagiri, which is also famous for Ashokan edicts and so on. And so we saw that this we should do something uh, to recover the information which is going to be lost forever and also make sure that this, you know, the lack of awareness of the importance of these hills as cultural resources was another thing which we bothered. So, and also make sure that we do have a map, a digital map of this area, where we can also uh, locate each and every piece of archaeological material uh, scattered across this landscape into that particular uh, AutoCAD map so that we will be able to go back as and when it is required to go and then do further investigation and so on and so forth. When we excavated, we come across this kind of uh, house floors with post holes and so on, and then these stone structures no bricks at that point of time. And then the surface of these boulders on top of the hills and also at the base of the hills are having paintings. Even they were threatened by modern day quarrying activity. And then some of these megalithic burials. And then you have these, uh, you know, what we call bedrock mortars. These are the places where grains were processed. These are the places where uh, stone, stone axes were also polished and so on. So that such bedrock uh, mortars we have um, on the hilltop, maybe if you have a count, there will be some 3,000 bedrock mortars here. Such an intense uh, you know, occupation of this area uh, around the time about 2000 BC or 4,000 years ago or so. And then uh, we have this, the entire dolerite dike 
nearly 2,000 imageries of uh, this bull associated with other animals and so on. But this is the most dominant special animal uh, that occurs in the landscape here. And then prior to this rock art uh, you know, activity began, we have these terracotta, terracotta bulls. So these are otu bulls. So the, you get them in hundreds if you excavate these areas. Wherever we excavated, we were able to collect several of them in one single trench measuring four by five meters or so. So you can, you can see that this was a ritual animal. This was a votive bull, no, no, not a toy kind of a thing, and that we come across this. And there is a clear example of uh, a mother goddess riding the bull. This is symbolic here. This association is seen in the Neolithic context right from 13,000 years ago in West Asia. So as I said in the beginning, there are sanctuaries built for these mother goddess and cattle and so on. So male and female deity. But later on, the relationship between the two is mother and son. And then we have associated with these uh, rock art sites are these dolerite blocks with these cupules. These cupules are places where if you tap this rhythmically, it gives a gong. Wonderful musical gong. So like in a temple, you have an excellent bell. This similar uh, sound can be produced from there. And some of these sites also, as I said, material remains. We had a lot of information. Varieties of stones, uh, which were procured from distant places, like, you know, the Robert Bruce Foot was the one who identified the source of these rocks. From these rocks, varieties of beads were manufactured by these people. And their source was at least 20 to 30 kilometers away from the settlement of the Neolithic. We do come across copper artifacts, sometimes gold, and then the ceramics are abundant. And then this is the typical stone axe that we come across in the Neolithic context there. And then later in time, as they progressed, both technologically and economically, uh, because the subsistence base was well established with the introduction of winter crops into this area around 1800, 1900 BC or so. So you have this emergence of what we call bichrome pottery, black and red ware, wheel thrown, and well navigated clay, and with graffiti marks as well. So these are multiple varieties of pottery uh, revealing improvement in the technology and also intensity of production. As I said, if you have winter crops introduced, you call it intensive agriculture. And if you have this kind of uh, large scale production associated with the production of pottery, earthenware pottery, as well as stone axes, we see this site as Robert Bruce Wood had site was the largest stone manufacturing activity. So that's it. This is the uh, digital map. We, uh, you know, we created a total station map where we have fixed all our antiquities and their location. And these are designated areas. And even here, we have nearly seven ash mounds. Three were at the base. Uh, several of them have been destroyed, only partially remaining here. And we found four more on top of the hills. So these ash mounds were occasionally isolated and more frequently very close to this village settlement itself. And a rock shelter, you know, there are two areas specialized in uh, production. One was meant for producing large stone axes. Another was, was producing microliths. These are the composite tools which were helpful in harvesting. And that is when they were produced from quartz, you know, quartz which is uh, occurring on the landscape here, whereas the dolerite which cuts through the granite as an outcrop on top of the hill was a source of uh, raw material for stone axes and so on. This site was excavated in 1946. And subsequently, when we returned, uh, we found a buried ash mound here. Because the earlier excavations were limited to small trenches, four by five, you know, three by five, something like that. But when we wanted to see the extent of the settlement and its character in terms of the way in which the village, you know, uh, <coughs> developed on a particular landscape, so it became necessary to excavate horizontally. And then incidentally, we discovered a buried ash mound. So that is where we could add to the initial three, four more, and then the ones which are on top of the hills are uh, rather relatively well preserved. So this reopening helped us do systematic sampling for reconstructing agriculture uh, from the earliest times when the settlers came here till the end of the settlement here around 12, 1300 BC. So this has a, a settlement history of about 1500 years. We 
took a transect from Eastern Ghats to Western Ghats and selected 40 sites. And among the 40 sites, this was the major investigation we carried out in order to see spatial expansion as well as distribution of uh, multiple varieties of food crops and uh, the proximity of local food resources in terms of wild progenitors of cereals, pulses, and millets, and so on. And that is where such large-scale opening up uh, of the trenches was essential. And then what they said, this, this was considered the largest stone axe factory. This is the dolerite and the ancient pit mine here. The blocks of dolerite were procured and then they were subject to by grinding. Uh, and so these are the circular features which we call individual houses come workshops. And there are series of them on this particular plateau. And uh, we excavated this and uh, recovered as many as 2,000 stone axes and uh, 40 lakh pieces of debitage. And then these are the blocks of granite where the axe edges were sharpened. These are called grooves. And these are cupules where the tip of the, um, you know, butt of the axe was rounded. So it's a triangular form, polished stone axe. And the edges were here. So individual uh, you know, workshops also have these blocks of granite where the axes were finished. And then we have the waste products here. Unfortunately, this, tie, this uh, label comes in the way. And below that, you have an ash mod. So the flakes resulting from napping the dolerite uh, to shape a, a stone cell, uh, you know, you, you have the entire plateau, you know, covered with maybe billion pieces of uh, dolerite flakes or so. So the, the excavation of that particular circular feature here, and then uh, you can see the, the depth of the grooves here. So the individuals living in this area uh, were also finishing the tool in terms of polishing and you know edge grinding and so on. And then in addition to that, part of this uh, circular feature was also a residential area. I mean, we found a hearth there. Hearth gave us charcoal, and charcoal gave us a radiocarbon date of about you know 1300 BC or so. So this site was uh, intensively occupied during this time period. So I said this is a Neolithic stone axe, but 1200 BC time period represents the transition from Neolithic to Iron Age. And that is where we see the large scale production. So this coincides with the production of black and red ware, uh, wheel made ware. And so it was in large scale production in, in implies the network of trade and exchange system operating in this particular region. And that's where we see Processes towards urbanization began as early as 1200 BC, not as generally assumed that until the emergence of Mauryans into this area and the establishment of the Shatavanas around first century BC, this region witnessed urbanization. That is not really true, but we can go back by another thousand years to establish. It's not, it's not the monumental buildings which characterized urban settlements, but also the you know, the production in terms of industrial scale production of various material goods, even the beads that we saw in one of the slides were, were also lapidaries existed at this point of time. So the axe blocks of uh, dolerite and initial chipping and then initial triangular form and then the process of grinding on those bedrock mortars that I showed you and the intensity and continuity of the grinding gives rise to this particular polished stone axis and so on. And you can see in the bedrock, a lot of these grooves, deep grooves, in, in indicating the activity, intensity of activity and the scale of production of these axes and so on. And these are all waste products which are still lying on the landscape there. And then the debitage. I, uh, the previous slide was concealing this, but you can see the nearly one meter thick debitage covering more than 500 square meter, um, you know, uh, plateau area on the large hill there. And then the view of the grinding, polishing, uh, uh, you know, mortars that we see initial, you know, shallow grinding, deep grinding, and then you know, further deep grinding gives rise to deeper and deeper uh, hollows into the granite. And these are V-shaped grooves where edges were ground and so on. So most important aspect of recent research was identification of these four staple food crops which were cultivated by the Neolithic people. They are all Neolithic, local, you know, independent uh, adaptation to this particular landscape. That was the time I said the Indus Valley civilization was on the decline, whereas here these hunter-gatherers were now identifying wild progenitors of two pulses and two millets. 
uh, in this area, and this began to cultivation, and they occur all over the region between Eastern and Western Ghats. Uh, by about 1900 BC, there is again, as I said, the introduction of winter crops and so on. So by 1900 BC, we have uh, wheat and barley from Indus Valley region uh, penetrating into this area via the North Deccan, that is the Deccan Maharashtra area and so on, and they were cultivated during the winter months. And then gradually, uh, you know, this PGNP was introduced from Orissa, pearl millet from Africa, ascent bean um, is also an African one, uh, and then the chickens from northern India and so on. So they gradually got incorporated into the, you know, agricultural economy of these, these people. And then we see the wild progenitors, their distribution. See, the pulses and millets that we see, they belong to these different ecosystems, whereas these settlements of the Neolithic are all located in this particular region, this particular stretch, east of the Western Ghats, and uh, this semi-arid tract right from Haryana to Nilgiris here. And then the food crops interaction between communities uh, in the peninsula gradually gave rise to introduction of these, and a broad package of food crops were cultivated by these communities and so on. So you have the red gram, uh, Pastar, or western part of Varisa, and then you have this, uh, <coughs> you know, horse gram, widespread, but the wild ones are, you know, uh, not present today, but you have only herbarium samples. But they, likewise, we have many of them. Uh, so what we thought that our work was generally uh, contributing to identifying this in this region as an independent center because there are nearly seven major independent centers where agricultural origins took place. Um, one is uh, Yellow Yangtze River Valley in China. You have, um, you know, the Ugrais, Tigris, Euphrates Valley, and uh, you have in the Ganges Valley in some region and in Gujarat, and then you also have peninsular South India. So this region, which is marked yellow, is the region where we have this tradition of Ashmont tradition. And this Ashmont tradition begins from about 2600 BC or so, and then continues up to 1200 BC. Post 1200 BC, we have the Iron Age, and then post Iron Age, we have the early historic transition around 500, 400 BC time period or so. That is the chronology of the way emergence of agricultural way of life and a successful adaptation to semi-arid environment in this particular region of peninsular India. Thank you.